with that, we turn to tonight's lecture on surveying the universe, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. And it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Stephen M. Kahn. Steve is Cassius Lamb Kirk Professor of Physics at Stanford University and Director of the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. He oversees all aspects of project construction and interactions with the funding organizations and the external scientific community. Previously, he served as Associate Laboratory Director of the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory, Chair of the Physics Departments at Stanford and Columbia Universities, as Director, Deputy Director, and Associate Director, variously, of the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysicists, Astrophysics and Cosmology at Stanford University, the Columbia Astrophysics Laboratory, and the Space Sciences Laboratory at Berkeley. He was also the U.S. Principal Investigator for the Development of the Reflection Grading Spectrometer currently flying on ESA's XMM Newton Observatory. Steve is well known for his many significant contributions to X-ray astronomy, especially high-resolution X-ray spectroscopy of cosmic sources. His current research interests focus on cosmological investigations using large optical surveys and the development of space and ground-based instrumentation for astronomy. In recognition of his contributions to astronomy, among other awards, he's been elected a fellow of the American Physical Society the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Steve earned a BA at Columbia, a PhD in physics at UC Berkeley, and he was a postdoctoral research fellow at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. His talk tonight is entitled Surveying the Universe, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Please hold questions to the end and join me in welcoming Steve to the podium. So let me thank you very much to the Society for this invitation and for all of you who are coming out tonight um, on April Fool's Day. <laughs> uh, I won't tell you any lies. I promised that during the talk, but I very much appreciate your coming. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you tonight about, um, as Larry said, the project that I direct, which is called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Some of you uh, may be wondering what the word synoptic means. I will confess that when the telescope was given this name, the people who named it did not know what the word synoptic meant. <laughs> they thought it meant something else. The root that, but it turns out that the, the correct definition is also actually quite appropriate. Synoptic comes from, syno, um, uh, from, from synopsis, and it means the whole, the recognition of the whole. So the, the name of this telescope is a, a survey telescope that surveys the whole of the sky. That's where it comes from. And the idea is extremely simple. Build a telescope that can take very large format pictures of the sky very quickly so that you can actually step along and survey the entire southern hemisphere of sky, half the sky, in just a few nights. And then do that repeatedly for 10 years. And so over 10 years, we will get something like a thousand images of every part of the southern sky. Okay, very simple idea. But the scientific implications are profound. In particular, we will measure everything that moves in the sky. Okay, comparison of different pictures, something that was over here is now over there. And that includes finding all the asteroids, all the comets, something called stellar parallax, which is the slight motion of stars as the Earth moves around the sun, the apparent motion of stars. Proper motion, which is the true motion of stars in the sky, a comparison at different times. Again, if you compare all these multiple exposures, we'll measure everything that changes in brightness in the sky. So things like variable stars, supernovae, which are stellar explosions, Quasars, which are black holes that emit tremendous amounts of energy and whose light varies as the, as the conditions around the black hole changes. And very short kinds of cosmic outbursts called gamma ray bursts that only last for a few seconds. 
And then if you add together all of these thousand exposures of every part of the sky, we'll measure everything in the sky. In particular, we will detect something like 20 billion galaxies. And about 4 billion of those will be measured with very high precision, which will enable us to do a lot of uh, sophisticated statistical analyses of the distributions of galaxies. I'll come back to this later, but 20 billion galaxies is a very interesting number in a lot of respects. First off, it'll be the first time in astronomy that we'll know of more objects in the universe than there are people on Earth. Everybody on Earth can own a few galaxies and a few stars. <laughs> There's plenty to go around. <laughs> and they can, they can access the database and find out what's happening. But it's also interesting in another respect. It turns out that the number of galaxies in the observable universe is finite. It's not finite because the universe is finite. It's finite because the observable universe is finite. As you look further out in space, you're looking further back in time. And eventually, you get far enough out, you're looking to a time when there were no galaxies, before galaxies were formed. And so if you ask, what is our estimate of the number of galaxies contained in that observable volume? It's about 100 billion. So we will be measuring or cataloging the existence of something like 20% of all the galaxies it's possible to catalog. This is not a technological limit limitation. We could spend 100 times more money on a bigger telescope in the future and we're not going to see more galaxies than this. So it's kind of a human achievement in a sense, analogous to first charting the structure of the Earth and various different things to actually start to truly survey the universe and treat the universe quantitatively as something which we actually have aims to sort of understand all aspects of. And that's why the name synoptic is especially appropriate to LSST. Okay, so what's new about this telescope we can do this? One of the questions I, I sometimes get naively asked in public talks is, this is such an obvious idea, why haven't we done it before? It's a good question. It turns out if you take all the telescopes that ever existed in human history and ask how much of the sky have they actually observed at, it's a fairly small fraction. And the reason has something to do with a quantity which is called étendue. It's a French term. And it refers to the product of the collecting area of the telescope times the field of view of the camera, okay? And that's related, it's directly related to how fast you can survey a large volume, a large region of sky. Now, why is that? Um, if you imagine you have a, a smaller collecting area, the telescope, at any given time, you're collecting less light. Therefore, it takes you longer to acquire an exposure that gets out to the faintness levels that you want to achieve. If you have a big camera, however, you're covering a bigger part of the sky in any given exposure. So it takes you fewer exposures to get across the sky. So a smaller mirror, big field of view, can get you across the sky fast. Alternatively, if you have a very big mirror and a small field of view, you can take the exposures very quickly, but you have to take more of them to survey the sky. So it's clearly the product of those two things, which affects what we call survey speed. And so this is a comparison. So this is the Gemini South Telescope, which turns out, I'll come to it later, is sitting on the same mountain that LSST is being built on. And this is an eight meter telescope. It's not the biggest in the world, but it's one of the bigger telescopes in the world. And so on some scale, this is a, an image, if you like, of the primary mirror that collects light for the Gemini telescopes, roughly eight meters in diameter, and on, a, on another scale, this is a sort of pictorial representation of the field of view of the biggest camera on Gemini South. And so this is LSST, we'll show more pictures of it later, and for reasons I'll come to, the, the primary mirror for LSST is actually an annulus, so it has a big hole in the middle. It's about the same total diameter on the outside. You can see this has somewhat less collecting area than that, but on the same scale, this is the field of view of the LSST camera compared to the Gemini camera. And Atundu is the product of these two versus the product of these two. So you can see the Atundu is much larger. 
And in fact, LSST has a roughly 10 times bigger Aton Dew than any other telescope that exists or is even planned to exist by in any, to be constructed by any country on Earth. So it's completely unique in this space. Okay, there's nothing, nothing even close that anyone else has built or is even considering building. So it's really a world unique facility addressing this science. So actually this idea behind wide field imaging of the sky, making a big camera and taking large pictures of the sky is, is actually not especially new. Uh, this is a drawing, as you can see, of the 48-inch uh, Schmidt telescope on Mount Palomar, which is a workhorse instrument during the uh, 40s and 50s. It took what are called the Palomar plates, which are large format images of, of most of the sky, and those were extremely important for forming the finding charts that astronomers could use to identify which objects they wanted to look at. In the old days, you would, just, you would figure out where your star is, you'd go take a picture of the Palomar plate, and then you'd recognize the star pattern, and you'd point your telescope at that object. So it's not new to think about taking pictures of big parts of the sky. What is new is to do that with highly sensitive electronic detectors. So the 48-inch the Schmidt telescope used big photographic plates. And as you know, the photo photography with photographic plates can yield beautiful pictures, but it's not especially sensitive. It doesn't get down to very, light, very low light levels. In order to detect very faint objects, we have to use electronic detectors, like charge couple devices, the kinds of electronic detectors which are in your cell phones and your digital cameras, but those that are tuned more for astronomy so that they're especially sensitive to very low light levels. Now it turns out, so this is a figure which combines a bunch of different points. And on the vertical axis is the area of sky covered by previous surveys. And then the horizontal axis is how faint did those surveys get. And forget the particular units here of limiting magnitude, but as you go to the right on the horizontal axis, you're getting to much fainter stars. And as you go up on the vertical axis, you're covering much larger regions of sky. And it turns out that this aton du times time, which is the collecting area times the field of view omega times the time that you run the survey, turns out to be proportional for most uh, telescope designs to time times the physical area of your detector. You can build the optics different ways, but in order to get a large aton du, you have to have a physically big detector. And these are all sorts of a set of previous surveys. This is a log-log scale, I should, print, I should point out. And if you put all these previous surveys up, you'll notice that they're, there's sort of an envelope, which is these, these red lines that I've drawn. This is for the optical, this is for the infrared. It turns out those red lines are constant aton due times time. And it's not terribly surprising that all the surveys lie on that line because they all had about the same size detectors, which are roughly about that big. And with a detector size that big, you could put it behind a big telescope, and so you'd have large collecting area, small field of view, or you could put it behind a small telescope and have small collecting area, large field of view, but you get the same aton do every way. So to move beyond this, you have to head out in that direction. Okay, get faint and also cover a lot of sky. And the only thing that really gets there is LSST. And the reason it gets there is because we're building an enormous electronic detector. That's really hard. In fact, the focal plane of the LSST camera is like the size of this table. Okay? And all previous cameras have had focal planes that were sort of much smaller like that. That's really the new advance. There are some other new advances as well, which I'll come to, but that's what makes this unique. And so, when you take these very large pictures to very faint levels of the whole sky, as I mentioned, you see a lot of stuff. 20 billion galaxies, lots of stars. This is actually a simulation. It's not a real photograph, but it's done with very high fidelity, uh, really simulating the way the optics and the camera will work on LSST. And this is what a single 15-second picture 
with LSST will look like of a blank part of the sky, but this is only one two hundredth of the field of view. So in that 15 second picture, we'll get 200 times this, and you can see how much detail is in there. And in fact, if you look at the computer screen, you'll see things that you can't see in the projection. But enormous numbers of objects. At this faintness level, m most everything you see is a galaxy, not a star. You've already looked out beyond the edge of the galaxies, and so you're just looking further out into the universe and enormous amounts of stuff. So I'll come back to it later, but one of the interesting challenges associated with this project is that that's a huge amount of information. Okay, 200 times that picture with all those objects in that picture means lots and lots of data. And to do science with it, you need to not only be able to process all those images, store that data, but you need to be able to find stuff in it later. How do you access very large databases like that? So that's another big technical challenge of the project. So the project um, is not just any old science project. It has had very strong support in the scientific community. And astronomers are very organized. Um, every 10 years, they go through a process called a decadal survey, where they put together all the astronomers in the country on various committees. They bring them to meetings, and they sit around and have deep discussions about what are the most pressing questions in astronomy, and what are the best future projects that we can consider building that might be useful. And it's because the astronomy community has made tough decisions like this that they've been quite successful with the US federal funding agencies in getting these projects going. It's not just everybody comes in the door and says, fund my project or fund this project. We go through this organized process, and everything's competed, and the whole community talks to one another, and then they issue a report, which is a prioritized set of projects. The last done one was done in 2010. It was called New Worlds, New Horizons. The title reflects the fact that some of the most pressing questions in astronomy right now have to do with exoplanets. What do other planets look like? Is there life elsewhere in the universe? And New Horizons refers to deep cosmological questions. How did the universe begin? How did it evolve with cosmic time? And what are the underlying forces that govern the dynamics of the universe? And in this survey, LSST was ranked as the highest priority large ground-based facility for the next 10 years. That's what enabled us to get the funding to go ahead and build it. And the thing that I personally am most proud of, being director of the facility, is that top rank was accorded not just on the basis of the compelling science case and the capacity to address so many science goals of the survey, but on the fact that the design was considered technically ready to build. We had done a lot of advanced engineering work, we had investigated all of the concerns about how you would do this thing, and we presented them with a technically complete proposal, which was as ascribed to be, okay, it's worth the money to go ahead and build that. So, where is this? We got formal approval to build LSST in August of 2014. Uh, it is what's called a major research equipment and facility construction project at the National Science Foundation. Those are projects which are sufficiently big that they're too costly to be done by any division of the National Science Foundation, so they have to be prioritized against all other science projects. And LSST was chosen that way. NSF issued a press release called Taking Astronomy to the Next Level. And on the NSF side, this is a $473 million construction project. Okay? And we had the first event um, kind of kicking off that construction roughly one year ago uh, in Chile. And the Chileans call that uh, the Prima, what is that? I forget the name. Uh, anyway, First Stone is the translation. Uh, the laying of the first stone that was held in April of 2015. This is the first stone for LSST. Uh, this is Franz Cordova, who some of you may recognize as the director of the National Science Foundation. She came down to Chile. This is Michelle Bachelet, who's the president of Chile. She came to the mountain to, to record this event. And this is Michael Hammer, who's the US ambassador to Chile. And this is a woman whose name I continue to forget, but she's the governor of the local region where the, the telescope is to be sited. 
Now, before going on, let me, I, I mentioned the NSF, but actually LSST is a joint project by development of the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy, and in particular the Office of High Energy Physics of the Department of Energy, and their contribution is about $168 million. So all total, it's about $650 some odd million. People ask me, why is the Department of Energy introduced in a, in, interested in a telescope? And the reason is, and I'll say a little bit about this later, LSST will provide some of the most constraining and important information we will get for understanding the nature of dark matter and dark energy in the universe. And those are two of the most pressing questions in all of fundamental physics. And it's traditionally the Department of Energy that has funded experiments in fundamental physics, so they're co-investing in this. And in addition to NSF and DOE, we also have substantial private contributions, in particular from Charles Simoni, who's the guy who created Microsoft Office, and his good friend Bill Gates. And uh, so they gave us the money to get the project started. So this project is complex in all sorts of ways. It's technically challenging to build, huge data, huge amount of money, and it's a public-private partnership with interagency cooperation. All the ways you can have to get people fighting with each other <laughs> and running into problems. And that represents, I would say, about 50% of my life right now is dealing with that level of complexity, which has nothing to do with building it. But it is an interesting aspect of it. Okay, so let me turn to some of the science that LSST will address. And we'll start with everything that moves in the sky. And so these are a series of time-lapse images of the same reason sky, not taken with LSST, taken with an existing uh, facility. And so you can see uh, this image was taken in 2003 at 5 hours, 54 minutes, and 11 seconds Greenwich Mean Time. This image is of the same part of the sky, taken roughly an hour later. And so you see most of the stuff looks similar. But this thing has changed. And so if you subtract this image from this image, most of the other stuff goes away. And all you're left with is this sort of yin-yang image. Something which was over here is now over there. OK, very simple idea. That's a moving object. This turns out to be an asteroid. So that's a very easy way to detect this stuff. You just compare these images, taken at different times, same part of the sky. Everything that's static will drop out, and you just look for the things that have moved. And that will get the asteroids. And there's all sorts of interesting things you can do with these asteroids. So these are, this is real data, actually. These data were taken from a previous survey called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. They detected asteroids. In a, they were much smaller than LSST, but the same basic ideas were used. And they detected asteroids, and they plotted these asteroids on this plot. So the vertical, the vertical axis on this plot is the sign of the inclination of the orbit. So it's roughly where is, that, where is that asteroid relative to the plane of the solar system. And the horizontal axis is the distance in astronomical units from the sun. And the colors on the plot are actually meaningful. They're not the real colors, but they do represent differences in the intrinsic colors of the objects. So if you, the objects which are drawn with a blue dot there have one particular kind of color spectrum, if you like, and the ones drawn with the red dots or the yellow dots or the green dots, a different thing. Now, for every one of these asteroids that you detect, you actually determine its orbit because you see it at multiple places. And you fit those places together and you fit that to a Newtonian orbit, and you can determine how is that object moving forward in time. But somewhat more interestingly, you can also trace its orbit backward in time. And even with Sloan, this was done, and you can find that if you take all the blue dots and you trace their orbits backward in time, at some earlier time in the history of the solar system, all those blue orbits come together. Okay, why is that? because they all started as one bigger object that ran into something else and fragmented and made a lot of smaller pieces. And those smaller pieces then went on their own orbits around the rest of the solar system. And it's similar with the red objects and the yellow objects and the green objects. So this is a kind of 
way of uh, doing archaeology on the evolution of the solar system. How did these small, how did things collide as the solar system uh, uh, evolved? And how did those objects propagate? And most of the asteroids that we see are like that. So, and this is a recurring theme as I go through the science you'll get from LSST that in many things we're using this as a kind of cosmic clock to track the evolution and the history of different components of the universe using these kinds of techniques. Now, another interesting use of detecting asteroids is to try to find the ones that are going to obliterate us. <laughs> okay, so it's a relatively small fraction, but not a zero fraction of the asteroids are what are called potentially hazardous, hazardous asteroids. And those are objects whose orbits could possibly intersect with the Earth. And if they intersect with the Earth, depending on how large they are, that could be pretty serious. Okay, so this is a plot estimating what the population of those are. So the horizontal axis here, there's various different units for it. One of them is, you know, this astronomer's term absolute magnitude. So the, uh, the brightest guys are here, the faintest guys are here. You can convert that brightness to sort of a physical size for the asteroid. So that's the horizontal axis. These are all log scales. So this is the diameter of the object in kilometers. And then you, given the size of it, you can convert that to how much damage would that do if it hit the Earth. And so the top horizontal scale is the impact energy in megatons of TMT, T, uh, of TNT. Okay, how big a bomb would this thing be if it hit the Earth? Now, not surprisingly, um, there's many, many smaller asteroids than there are really big asteroids. So the distribution, this is again a log-log scale, so the distribution it looks like what we call a power law. Okay, there's much fewer big guys and many more smaller guys. The red line, this, this figure was done circa 2009, 2010, so it's a little bit dated, but the red, it hasn't changed very much. The red line is a measure of how many of these objects we actually know about. Okay, so these guys up here are really, really bad, but we sort of know where they are. And we sort of know that none of them are going to hit the Earth in any time soon. These guys down here we know very little about, but most of those are going to burn up in the atmosphere. So they're not going to do very much. But there's a region in the middle here, which is right around... Um, 140 meters or so, or, uh, you know, 100 meters. And those guys are pretty bad because they're big enough to get through the atmosphere and impact the Earth, and yet they're small enough that we don't know where most of them are. Okay, so in terms of, uh, or even their, of their existence. So, so in terms of, you know, what is the potential lingering threat, that's a big problem. And Congress, in its infinite wisdom about scientific topics, uh, chose to pass a resolution in the early 2000s that instructed NASA to go find all the asteroids that could impact the Earth down to 140 meters in size with 90% efficiency and to do that by 2020. It's a law, it's on the books. Um, but as is typical uh, with Congress, they didn't give NASA any more money. <laughs> so NASA ignored that mandate. It's called the Congressional Mandate. NASA ignored it. And then they were called to testify before the House Science Committee, why did you ignore our mandate? And they said, oh, well, that's a billion dollars. Give us a billion dollars, we'll do it. So it didn't go anywhere. And in fact, I was at one of these Congressional uh, House Science Committee meetings where we testified about LSST, because I'll come to LSST, we'll get to this mandate. But we, we came to talk to them about it. But of course, we can't do it by 2020, because they didn't fund us to build the thing in time. So it won't actually even be operating until 2022, and it'll take us till about 2032 or so to find all those asteroids. And so we, didn't officially, we don't officially make the mandate, because it said 2020, but 
in terms of the quantitative, getting down to 140 meters, et cetera, we'll get there. And so in our testimony to this effect, the congressman who was asking these questions said, well, what are we supposed to do for those 10 years? <laughs> so this shows the congressional understanding of statistical probability and some other concepts. But the bottom line is that LSST will actually meet the mandate. We have to do this a bit. And we're still arguing a bit with NASA about how this complements space big things, but it will, it will really address this question. Okay, so let's move out of the solar system and talk a little bit about stars. As I told you, LSST will measure everything that varies in brightness in the sky. And that will address many, many long-standing questions in basic stellar astronomy. How, do, how, do stars, how are stars born? How do they evolve with time? What, are the, what is the physics underlying that? And one of the, the major um, observational approaches that astronomers have been using for you know, over 60, 70 years or so are just simply to make plots of stars and where do they lie in various diagrams. So these are what are called Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams for stellar clusters. And so the vertical scale is how bright is the star and the horizontal scale is going in the wrong direction as it turns out, but how hot is the star? What is the temperature of the star? So the hottest stars are at this end and they tend to be brighter and the cooler stars are down here and they tend to be fainter. And you can see in these diagrams that the points are not distributed randomly all over the place. They lie on particular paths and that main path is called the main sequence. And it's actually the locus of points in this diagram that stars would be at while they're burning hydrogen, which is the, the longest duration aspect of a stellar lifetime. So plots at different points in the main sequence are actually different stars. They have different masses, uh, but they're all sort of burning hydrogen, and that's where they lie. And so we've learned tremendous amounts from diagrams like this. We categorize uh, uh, stars in all sorts of different ways. But one of the big problems in astronomy, in fact, the biggest problem in astronomy is that it's very hard to tell how far away something is. You can measure how apparently bright it is. You can measure where it is. You can measure whether it changes in time. But it's very hard to measure distances because on the scale that we can resolve stars, they're all essentially infinitely star far away. So what's new about LSST is not finding the stars or measuring the stars, it's measuring their distances. And the way that we'll do that is primarily via this parallax that I was talking about earlier. So as the Earth goes around the Sun, a given star should shift its angular position very slightly. Now, if the, if the star is very close to the sun, then you'll see a bigger angular shift. Clearly, as you go further away, that angular shift goes small, gets smaller. The sort of outer regions of the galaxies are on the order of 1,000 parsecs to 10,000 parsecs away, which means that the characteristic angular shift that you'll see is in the thousandths of an arc second range. And the atmosphere for a ground-based telescope typically limits your observations to somewhere between a half an arc second and one arc second. So how would you ever see a thousandth of an arc second? And most previous, pre previous ground-based telescopes could never do that. The difference with LSST is that we get so many exposures of every star, and we have so many stars in every picture that we can do an extremely accurate statistical treatment of where any star is and do that over all these repeated observations, and you can show that over 10 years we get down to sort of milli arc seconds, statistically, in the measurements of any individual stellar position. And so for the first time, we'll actually be able to put a distance scale on these diagrams. And that's a major paradigm-changing event in testing these models, because it's not relative anymore, it's now actually how intrinsically bright they are. And then there are other things that you can do if you can separate out the distances to stars. In particular, um, when you look up in the sky, you see a lot of stars. Some of them are close by, some of them are far away. How do you segregate those? But if you can filter out the nearby stars and only look at stars that you know are in the outer regions of the galaxy, then you can start to see things that you wouldn't see otherwise. So this is a picture, again, taken with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It's sort of a faint region of sky. And they filtered out all of the nearer stars that they could. 
And so you see something really bright here, which is called the Sagittarius stream. But if you look also, you can see sort of these faint streamer things. It doesn't quite look randomly distributed. There are things that look like striations in those pictures. Those are actually real. And they correspond to satellite galaxies of the Milky Way that have fallen into the Milky Way over cosmic time. So if you imagine something which looks like a very small galaxy or a loose collection of stars, it's gravitationally attracted to the Milky Way. And over cosmic time, it starts to fall toward the Milky Way. But as it falls toward the Milky Way, there are tidal forces that are different on one side of that object from the other. So it tends to pull that object apart. And the stars in that system get pulled out along the path of infall. And those stars remain where they are for billions of years. And so you can see this trail. They're called tidal streams or tidal trails, which are the remnants of these smaller objects that over cosmic time have fallen into the Milky Way. So if we can find those and, co and connect them, we actually trace out the history of the formation of the Milky Way. I told you before, LSST is like a cosmic clock. We can use the asteroids to trace out the history of the solar system. This is the way to trace out how did the Milky Way form as a galaxy over cosmic time and gradually accrete more and more material. And this is, this is a simulation of what we expect to see where we've enhanced this. Uh, this is kind of the state of the current data, which tells us very little about distances from the, from the Milky Way. But you can see that we expect to see these very dramatic remnants or trails of objects that have fallen in over cosmic time. And they will tell us both about the intrinsic gravitational interactions of the Milky Way and, again, how it formed. And you can imagine doing that just to find these small satellite objects in the Milky Way itself. So this is, again, a simulation, but this is what a faint, uh, you know, high galactic latitude region of the sky will look like if you just plot all the stars from LSST. And then if you take out all the nearby ones, then you get down to a picture more like this, and you can start to see there's something there. And then if you smooth this picture, you can see that you've detected a real galaxy, which would have been completely, essentially invisible in this general picture. So this degree of segregating by distance is extremely important to finding new things. And that will be largely new uh, with this telescope. And then, uh, since we're measuring all the variable objects, there are lots of stars that vary in the sky. Uh, many of them are, uh, they gr vary periodically. Either the star alternately go, uh, blows in and out its stellar size, and that gives variations in brightness. Or it can be a binary star system where two stars are orbiting one another. We know about lots of those different kinds of systems. So this is a plot of just what is the amplitude of the oscillation versus the period in days. And different classes of objects you know, appear in different regions of this, di doc, uh, this diagram. LSST will increase our samples of these kinds of systems by factors of 100 to 1,000. So we'll, we'll start go from just recognizing different classes of things to having very large samples of them, which are amenable to very detailed statistical studies that will help us better understand those phenomena. And one of the interesting things is looking for exoplanets. So LSST is not a great exoplanet machine. It's not what it's designed for. But it will find a sample of objects which are called hot Jupiters. These are planets which are like the size of Jupiter but are very close to their parent star. So if you imagine a big planet close to its parent star, it will go in front of the parent star, and you'll see a dimming of the star, okay, as the planet obscures some of the light, and that will be periodic, and if they're close in, then you'll see that frequently. LSST will detect them. So this is a plot of, given the, the period of the planet's orbit around its star and the radius of the planet itself, this is the probability that LSST will detect it. Not surprisingly, it gets to be high if you're talking about big planets which are very close to their star. And this is a plot of how far away in the galaxy we can find such hot Jupiters. And it goes out to several thousand parsecs, which is sort of the, through the whole galaxy. So we know about a number of these systems now. LSST will increase the sample much larger. None of these things are Earth-like planets, so it's not going to tell us more about, you know, are, there, are, are, there, are we alone in the universe? But it is interesting for just the study of, of large planets themselves and their demographics. 
But some of the most interesting information in sort of looking at these time variations lies in these so-called outburst type phenomena, things that go bump in the night, okay? Stellar explosions or other such phenomena. And we actually know very little about that topic. Not because we're dumb, but basically because we've just really never looked. We, we don't have a lot of data on how did, over large parts of the sky, how did things vary. So this is a plot of, you know, how bright is an outburst versus what is the characteristic time scale by which it goes up and goes down, okay? Where, you know, this is one day, this is 100 days, this, uh, this is one day, this is 10 days, this is 100 days, etc. And on a plot like this, there's various sort of things you can put. So this is where what are called classical novae lie. These are type 1a supernovae. Uh, these are core collapse supernovae. These are luminous view blue variables, luminous red novae. There's a bunch of stuff on this plot. But you'll notice big things, there's big white regions on the plot. And that's just because we really don't know. It's not that there's nothing, no other kinds of new cosmic explosions. Defined there, it's just we don't know because we haven't really looked. And LSST will provide some of the first data on that. And so these pie charts are kind of, you know, what do we expect to see when you catalog all these variations in time of things? Well, it turns out most of them are boring, depending on your science. So something like 75% of them will be asteroids. Earlier I told you the asteroids are interesting, but if you're interested in cosmic explosions, asteroids are boring and they're annoying because they get in the way of all your data. They'll be 75%. Those are, known as, uh, uh, those are new asteroids that we'll discover. About 20% will be previously known asteroids. About 4% will be run-of-the-mill traditional variable stars. And only about 1% of that whole pie will be true transients, true new kinds of co cosmic explosions. And if you take that 1% and blow it up into its own pie, uh, pie about half of those are supernovae. And we'll detect lots and lots of supernovae. Uh, about another quarter are active galactic nuclei, which are black holes. 7% will be novae. And this like 20% of that 1% might be these really new, previously unknown things that are there to discover. So this is a really exciting area of science. LSST will detect a lot of stuff, but the hardest problem is not going to be f getting the detections. The hardest problem is going to be finding that stuff in the midst of all this other boring stuff. It's a needle in the haystack problem. LSST will issue 10 million alerts per night telling the world that there have been changes in stars. 10 million. You don't take that on your cell phone and go to the telescope. 10 million per night. Now even if you take out all the asteroids and all the variable stars and all that stuff, it's still about 100,000. 100,000 is still too many to figure out how to go to your telescope. So the really interesting scientific problem is how do you use the information we have to filter that down? It's a kind of triggering problem to recognize the truly interesting uh, things that are out there. And there are various ideas how to do it, but it's not entirely a solved problem. Okay, let me move out of the galaxy now and talk about extragalactic astronomy. So this is a plot of how large a volume of the universe are we actually sampling with different surveys? And on the horizontal axis is something called the redshift, which is a measure of how far away a galaxy is. And these are previous surveys. Again, this is a log-log scale. And LSST, it's not surprising it's the largest column on the chart, it gets up to 10 to the 12th cubic megaparsecs which, as I mentioned earlier, is sort of rivaling the total observable volume of the universe. And that's why we get so many galaxies. And as you can see, it's orders of magnitude and goes much deeper out into space than all these previous things that have come before that. But one of the most interesting things about these images is not just that we'll detect lots of galaxies, but because it's a big telescope, we'll also measure those galaxies with um, a fair amount of precision what we call low surface brightness. So we'll not just see the thing, but we'll actually get a good picture of it. So this is a case, this is a picture taken with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is a certain sort of surface brightness sensitivity. This is an object, this is a picture of exactly the same field, but taken in a much longer exposure, which is similar to what LSST will get over the whole sky. 
And so you can see if all you have is this picture, yeah, that's some run-of-the-mill elliptical galaxy. But when you do it with much higher precision, you see you get all this interesting stuff. Here's another example. What are these rings and all of that stuff? Those are those tidal streams that I was telling you about earlier. These are smaller things that have sort of fallen into these galaxies over cosmic time. And we will do this for hundreds of millions to billions of galaxies. So it's just really getting enormous amounts of information about what are the intrinsic shapes and histories of formation about all the galaxies in the universe. Okay, the last scientific topic I'll talk about is dark matter and dark energy. And we will do that by means of something called gravitational lensing. So Einstein's theory of relativity showed, one of the most interesting things it showed of general relativity, is that a gravitational field deflects light. So if you have a concentration of mass, and there's a gravitational potential around that, and you look at an object behind it, the light from that object behind it is actually bent on its way toward Earth. It's very much just like a glass lens, okay? This is a simulation, it's not real data, but this is a cluster of galaxies, it's a collection of dark matter, and this is what you would see if you look deeply at the field of that. So you're starting to see the background galaxies, but as you get close here, you notice you don't just see points anymore, you see these circumferentially distorted images. Those are multiple, in some cases multiple images, in some cases one image of a background galaxy sitting behind the concentration of mass, and the light is distorted as it passes through. And that's an observable effect. And what's especially interesting about it is that it measures the total mass, not just the mass in stars, or the mass in what we call baryons, the normal mass we can see. It also measures all the dark mass. So this is a means of directly observing dark matter. We call it dark matter because it's dark, meaning you can't see it. But actually, you can see it. You can see it by looking at its lensing effects on the background light. So this is a field which has been in existence for about 15 years now. There's lots of examples of it. People are doing more and more exposures. And actually, we're able to map out the dark matter distribution of different kinds of objects. And one of the things that's been, been measured in the last few years uh, have really made it clear that dark matter is fundamentally different than all the other matter we're looking at. So these are two examples, there are now more than two, of two clusters of galaxies, massive concentrations of dark matter, which have actually collided over cosmic time. They've run into each other. Most of the normal matter in those clusters of galaxies in the form of hot gas, which is trapped in the, in the, in the gravitational potential, and that hot gas is mapped in the red light, actually the magenta light. And using this gravitational lensing technique, we can measure the total mass. And that's, mar that's actually displayed in the blue light. And as you can see, those are separate. So what happened? You have two concentrations of dark matter and hot gas. They run into each other. The dark matter, because it doesn't interact, goes right through, like nothing happened. The gas runs into the other gas and forms a shock, and that's what you see in the middle. So these observations tell you unambiguously that dark matter is not just a new way of looking at gravity. It's really a different component of the system. It's not related to any of the matter we're familiar with that you can direct. And we'll get many, many, many more examples of this kind of thing with LSST. And then you can use this gravitational effect to also study an even bigger mystery in current physics and astronomy, which has to do with dark energy. The term dark energy refers to the fact that we now know that the universe is not only expanding, it's accelerating its, in its expansion. And that requires the existence of some kind of vacuum energy field with negative pressure, which actually dominates the energy density in the entire universe. We know nothing about dark energy. A famous cosmologist said, and I was telling people this earlier, we know less than zero about dark energy. Why is it less than zero? Because not only do we not understand it, it makes us not understand the stuff we thought we understood. <laughs> so, so it's causing basic problems with our understanding of quantum field theory, 
where their understanding of that whole field theoretic description of interactions in the first place, it's the most pressing problem in physics. So how are we going to get at that problem? Well, one means is to use what is called weak gravitational lensing, which are correlations in the shapes of galaxies as you look at different parts of the sky. This diagram looks sort of biological. I apologize for that. So what's meant to be is these are background galaxies. And these tubes are the light rays coming from those background galaxies on their way to Earth. Now, because of gravitational lensing, as those, as those light rays propagate, they run into dark matter concentration that bends the tubes, and then they run over here. The point is that nearby galaxies on the sky, their light goes through similar concentrations of dark matter. So you expect to see each one of these galaxy images is slightly shifted in its position, and it's slightly distorted in its shape. But if you look at any one galaxy, you didn't know what shape it had to begin with, and you didn't know where it was to begin with, so you can't tell whether it was lensed or not. On the other hand, nearby galaxies on the sky should have correlations in their shape. Okay, so we should see a correlation in the shapes and orientations of galaxies as a function of how far they are away, they are away in the sky. And that measurement of correlations will tell us how much concentrations there, there are in the dark matter as you go back further out in the universe and further back in time. Now this is related to something called the growth of structure. The universe started out extremely homogeneous, but there were very slight differences in density from place to place. As the universe expanded, because gravi gravi gravity is an attractive force, those small over-densities got bigger and the places that were under densities got sparser. And so as the universe evolved, the places that were slight over densities grew the first stars, eventually became galaxies, and then the galaxies come together and form clusters of galaxies. As the universe evolves, we see more and more structure. The universe today doesn't look anywhere near homogeneous because there's all these concentrations in what we're seeing. That's the growth of structure with cosmic time. And we understand that process. It's really just Newtonian physics. So if we can measure its rate, then we can determine how is the universe expanding underneath it. Because clearly, if the universe is expanding faster, it's going to be harder to get those concentrations to grow. And if the universe is expanding slower, then you can form more concentrations. So using this gravitational lensing technique, we can figure out how the growth of structure occurred with cosmic time. And that turns out to be a measure of dark energy. I'm not really going to explain this plot because it's one dimensionless variable versus another dimensionless variable. But just to tell you that there's different curves on this plot, and they correspond to different redshift intervals, different parts in time. And as you look back further to higher redshift or further back in time, you see more gravitational lensing. Not surprising because there's more stuff in front of you as you look at further galaxies. But it's the rate at which these curves grow that is extremely sensitive, incredibly sensitive to exactly how did the universe expand with cosmic time. And that's essentially a direct measure of dark energy. And so we're trying to do this with extremely high precision to measure the history of the cosmic expansion. So remember, LST gives you the history of the solar system, the history of the galaxy, and now the history of the entire universe, all in the same project. And this is very, very challenging because the kind of distortions we're looking for are roughly a part in 10 to the 5, which means if you look at a circular galaxy, due to gravitational lensing, it will be, become elliptical at roughly one part in 10 to the 5. That's really hard to measure. And in particular, it's hard to measure because it's hard to build your optics or your telescope that don't distort that way. It's hard to build a camera that doesn't make those distortions. Maybe the algorithms you're using to process the images cause things. You have to go into incredible detail to study all of those systematic effects to understand that we act, what we're actually measuring is a true cosmic phenomenon, not just an artifact. And that's what's driven a lot of the physicists, including myself, to work on this project. Okay, that's enough science. Let me just show you some pictures and talk very quickly about what LSST will look like. There's multiple components to this project. There's the telescope itself and its enclosure. There's what will be the world's biggest digital camera for astronomy. There's getting the data from Chile where the telescope will be built to the United States where we can analyze it. And there's one of the most interesting aspects of the project is associated with education and public outreach. 
bringing the universe home to everybody. Anybody with a personal computer can log on and look at any part of the sky at any given time. And there's so much data, the more human eyes involved with this, the better. So, for example, we will detect 250,000 supernovae per year. We can give a galaxy to every school in the world, to every classroom in every school in the world, and tell them, look at your galaxy and see if a supernova went off. And 250,000 times a year, one will. And in many cases, those kids will be the first human eyes to actually look at that image. Okay? We will have detected it, of course, with the computers, but we're not going to look at a billion galaxies every night. So, <laughs> so it is the potential to kind of engage the public in direct connections to scientific discovery, and in particular to the universe, is one of the most interesting aspects of this whole thing. Okay, so this is, where, this is what LSST's site looked like before we started messing with it. Uh, it's a beautiful site in the Chilean Andes. This is where the telescope will go. This is Calibration Hill. This is what the, the, the telescope uh, facility looks like on the mountain. It's somewhat unusual looking for a telescope. It looks more like an ocean liner. Um, that's not an accident, it turns out. We were very interested in, in preserving the pristine atmospheric conditions in the vicinity of the telescope. One of the biggest limitations to, te to imaging with ground-based telescopes is turbulence in the atmosphere right around the telescope. And to minimize that, you need to, you really want the telescope to be the first thing that wind hits when it gets there. So the prevailing winds on this site go in this direction. And so we put all of the services in the building downstream. So all the energy disposition, dip, deposition in the atmosphere is down here. And so the telescope sees this really pristine air. And you can see that the telescope dome is highly louvered to try to equilibrate uh, the atmospheric conditions in the vicinity of it. This is a blow up of what the facility looks like. There's the telescope itself. There's a big elevator. Actually, you can see here it's not called an elevator. It's called a vertical platform lift, or VPL. And the reason for that is you're not allowed to call something an elevator unless it's certified to take people. <laughs> so this vertical platform lift is for transporting the mirror up and down. We recode it. It won't have any people. And therefore, it's a VPL but I call it an elevator. Uh, there'll be a clean room to refurbish the camera, a coating facility to recoat the mirrors, a shop, and then there's a place, a control room, where all the astronomers will sit when they're working there. We also have a base facility in the nearby town, which is 100 kilometers away. So construction is well underway. This is no longer a virtual project. These pictures were from a few months ago. Over our summer, which is the Chilean winter, we had greater than typical snowfall that created problems. We lost about a month of schedule, and the NSF beat us over the knuckles for that. And we said, it snowed. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's a big, expensive project. You've got to stay on, on schedule. And so that was, a, that was an issue. Uh, this is what it looked like as of December. You can see the vertical construction columns going up for the facility. This is an aerial view. We brought ourselves a drone. So we fly around the site with the drone. We take pictures of it every day. Uh, this is from about January. You can see the construction pier starting to form. And this, this is actually about a week ago. And you can see this caging going up, which is where the concrete circular pier that will take the telescope is about to sit. The telescope itself is unusual in design. It's short and squat. And the reason for that is that we're moving this thing around all the time. We take a picture every 15 seconds. We take two in a row, separated by four seconds, and then we move to another field, which is typically a few degrees away. So we can't have a, a telescope which you move slowly and you wait for it to settle down before you take the next picture. We need a really stiff structure that we can chuck around all over the sky. And uh, so a lot of design engineering went into that. Um, it goes uh, to adjacent fields, which are typically about three and a half degrees away, and settled and is ready for the next picture in four seconds. And so we take uh, two images roughly in 39 seconds. So you see we're trying to use the night very efficiently, spend as much time as possible taking pictures. The optical design for LSST is also very unusual. So the light comes in and hits this annulus. I showed you as an annulus before. Then reflects up to a convex secondary mirror, on into a tertiary mirror, which is pretty close to where the primary is, 
and then on up into the camera, and there are three lenses in the camera plus a filter which determines which color man is going on. Now that's unusual. There aren't a lot of telescopes built that way. Why is that? And the reason is we want to get a very large field of view with high precision, and since it's a very squat telescope, we're doing that at low focal ratio. LSSD is an f1.2 system. Those of you who are amateur photographers, uh, photographers know that if you put a f1.2 lens on your camera, you got nearly no depth of field, okay? You can focus on the tip of someone's nose and their eyes are out of focus. So when you have that fast a system, everything has to be precisely machined to keep it in focus, and you need to correct for aberrations that are coming off axis. And I don't have time to talk about this, but the only way to do that is to have three reflections. And so that's we go. So three large optics. The tertiary mirror in LSST is the size of the Palomar mirror, five meters. And this secondary mirror is three and a half meters in diameter. So, so these are very large optics that have to be precisely aligned. Now you may have noticed that the primary and the tertiary lie very close to each other. And so we made a decision to fabricate those out of the same monolithic glass substrate. Nobody had ever done that before with this technology, and it was very challenging. The reason it's challenging is because you've got to get these two surfaces. They need to be coaxial. This diameter is 8.4 meters. They need to be coaxial to within a half a millimeter. So as you make those polished surfaces, you, have to, you, can't, you don't have the freedom to, to realign them. You have to ensure that you're fabricating with them with that accuracy, and they have to be co-pointed as well. The, 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 the optical axis have to be parallel. And there's another thing, which is more of a detail, but the way these mirrors are made are by spin casting. You take molten glass, and you put it in a rotating oven, and you rotate the oven at precisely the right rate, that as the glass cools, it forms roughly the figure of the parabola that you want in the optic, and then you just do fine machining on that. And that's been done many times before. But with LSST, we're trying to make two figures. So you can't get both of them right in the oven. <laughs> so we spin it to get the outer figure right, and then you've got to take out a lot of material to make the tertiary, and that had never been done before. But the good news is this is done, actually. We finished this mirror about a year ago. It met all of our specifications. And then we got to a point, which was a really tricky point, <laughs> where we had to lift that mirror off its polishing jig and put it in a box and transport it. And you can see that was done with these vacuum chucks. I was very nervous watching this happen. Uh, we did it very slowly. If we lost vacuum on this thing and dropped this thing, that would have been out. We would have been out 30 million in six years. Okay. <laughs> but fortunately, that all went well. We put the, we put the mirror in a box. And then, because it's actually ready earlier than we need it, we have to store it somewhere. We found a place called the Millionaires Club in the Tucson airport, which is where rich people store their private planes. And there was a space there that we could put our mirror. And so we drove it through the streets of Tucson from the fabrication facility to this Millionaires Club. And we did that at a roaring speed of about a mile and a half an hour. And because we were driving through the streets of Tucson in a mile and a half an hour, we chose to do it at 2 in the morning. So there wasn't a lot of traffic around. But there are people running around in cars at 2 in the morning in Tucson, so there were still some issues about that. Anyway, that all went without a flaw, and so the mirror's in storage, and it's great. Then we get to the camera. The camera is 3.2 billion pixels. It's physically extremely large. The entrance lens to the camera is 1.6 meters in diameter, so it's about 5.5 feet height. Okay, so imagine that. This, this is about 12 feet in length. So the camera, when fully assembled, fills a, a room. It weighs 3,000 kilograms. It's got all kinds of junk in it, um, a lot of moving parts, lots of electronics. Um, it's, it is certainly the most complex camera ever fabricated. Uh, and there's a large team of people working on it. And one of the reasons you can see how complex this is, so these are the CCD sensors that will go in the focal plane. These sensors are about um, an inch and a half in size. There are, two, there are 189 of them that make up this fully multiplex uh, focal plane. They have to be positioned with respect to one another in terms of how high they are to within five microns. They have to be flat within five microns, positioned to within another few microns. 
And as you can see, they're almost touching. We want to use that real estate as efficiently as possible, so there's a half millimeter gap between those sensors. And if you allow them to touch, you destroy them. And they're about $120,000 each. So there's a huge sort of engineering thing on how do you build this thing. We have the focal plane made up in a modular units, and how do you actually assemble this and make this together? And that's also one of the most challenging aspects of the project. And lots of camera subsystems have been prototyped and are being produced, the electronics, the filter changer, um, the um, refrigeration system, which I don't have time to go into, but then there's a novel refrigeration system. We have two different sources for producing the CCDs themselves. Anyway, lots of equipment, all of that's coming together now. And we built a very large clean room at Slack National Accelerator Laboratory to assemble this camera. And when this picture was taken, you see there was nothing in the clean room. <laughs> That's because it was just built. We've now started to move things in. And the assembly of that camera will occur in earnest over the next couple of years. And then the last technical topic I'm going to talk about is the data. So LSST will produce an enormous data volume. Over the 10 years of observing, it will be something on the order of three to 400 petabytes. A petabyte is 10 to the 15 bytes. So this is a few times 10 to the 17 bytes. That's far more data than everything that's ever been written in any language in human history. Okay, that's that. When we first started this, it rivaled the largest database in the world. Now it turns out it's not the largest database in the world. It's only about 5% of the database from all the selfie pictures people have taken with their cell phones <laughs> <laughs> all over the world. But I think it's impressive that it's still about 5% of that when you consider all that is. And most of those data are not archived. So we've got to produce all those data, we've got to run it through computers, and we've got to build a database that's accessible. Now, one of the interesting things is that, you know, so you analyze all these images, you find all the galaxies and all the stars, you catalog them right there in the project, their properties. That catalog will be trillions of lines long. And you want to query it in all kinds of interesting ways. Find me all the objects that look like this or nearby something else. With trillions of lines in the database, most of the standard commercial database technologies completely break. So we had to assemble a crack team of computer scientists to figure out exactly how to handle that large data volume, and more importantly, how to do something useful with it. Uh, you might wonder about the raw computing power. So this is, uh, some of you may have seen charts like this before. This is our estimate, this plot's a, a little bit dated, but this is our estimate as to how many CPUs we need as a function of time. Uh, and you can see it builds up linearly once we start running the survey because we're accumulating more data. This is uh, something called the top 500 plot. So this is the, the, the most powerful computer in the, uh, in, in the world as a function of time, the 250th most powerful computer and the 500th most powerful computer. This is the log scale. The fact that these things increase this way is the famous Moore's law, okay? So LSST at the time we come online is gonna be about here. So it's not that big a computer center. It'll be in the top 500, but not that big a deal. So raw computing isn't the big deal. The real big deal is how do you find stuff in such a large database? And then it might, you might be interested in how do we get the data from Chile to where we're going to do most of this processing, which is in Urbana-Champaign, Illinois. And it turns out that we have two redundant fiber optic links coming out of the site. These are 100 gigabit, gigabit links, so they're fine for our purposes. There were, there's a lot of dark fiber that was put in South America. When, when the fiber optic revolution came and communication was clearly the way, the South American countries invested a lot in laying optical fiber and then they found they didn't have the customer base for it. So there's a lot of dark fiber, which is great for us, it's available. The only new fiber we have to run is from the mountain to the coast. That's about 100 kilometers, it costs us $10 million, but we'll have that there and everything else we can use existing lines. And our database system, we've now developed a data management system to process these images, and of course we're trying it out on existing data. So these are two images taken from existing telescope projects. This one shows deep, deep imaging, and this one shows difference imaging along the lines of what I showed you before, and our software is basically passing muster. 
So this is my, my last slide. This is a schedule. I don't expect you to read this. Uh, there's lots of items on it, but just to sort of show you where we are. Uh, we're right about here. So we've done a bunch of stuff already. We will begin assembling the telescope and the camera together, early integration test in 2019. Then we'll do a bunch of commissioning activities in, in 2020, 2021, and then we will officially start the survey in 2022. And I think that is all I had to say. So thank you very much. So we have time for some questions. There are three people with microphones scattered around the room. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Wait till the microphone comes to you. When you get the microphone, would you please stand up, tell us your name, tell us if you're a member of the society. No penalty if you're not, just want to know, <laughs> and ask a question. So there's one mic over there. Uh, Kirby Runyon, and I am a member of the society. Um, I believe that the European Space Agency recently launched the Gaia spacecraft, which is a parallax distance measuring spacecraft, and I'm curious how that is redundant to or complementary to the parallax measuring capabilities of LSST. Yeah, it turns out it's remarkably complementary. So Gaia is a space-based project, um, but it's a very small telescope in comparison, so it can only look at brighter stars. So not surprisingly, if you take the astrometric accuracy, how well they can do the parallax message, measurement, it's best on the brightest objects and gets worse as you go fainter. And where Gaia drops off, which is around magnitude 19 or 20, is exactly where LSST picks up, and our curve is pretty much a continuation of theirs. So our best astrometric accuracy is their worst, but we're on the proper extension as a function of magnitude going out to fainter and fainter stars. So the two projects are actually remarkably synergistic. We didn't plan it that way, we got lucky, but that's the answer. <laughs> Glenn Chinnery, uh, retired EPA mechanical engineer. I was wondering if you could tell us uh, amateur astronomers with eight inch equatorial mount telescopes, how many parameters you have to track and correct for in your clock drive? Yeah, so the tracking um, is not a huge number of parameters, but all three of our mirrors are active optic systems and the camera itself is on a hexapod which gives us six degrees of freedom of actuation. So we measure the wavefront sensing simultaneously with acquiring these images. And that primary tertiary mirror, for example, has 160 actuators behind it, which are precision pressure points to adjust that surface figure. And we are tuning that up essentially continuously, roughly at a rate of you know, a few times a minute. And that's true for the secondary mirror and the and the actuation of the, the camera as a whole. So all told, there's, I don't know, probably about 300 degrees of freedom that are being adjusted in the system. Uh, Bob Terry, a society member. Uh, why is it that elements of the focal plane will destroy each other if they touch ever so lightly, I think? I mean, okay. what, what, what does that? And second question, when you build this map of all the stuff you're looking at, are you going to sort of naturally put it into a 3D image of where it sits relative to the Earth? Right. Or what are you going to do to organize right. it? So let me f address the sensor question. So at least, so the issues with the sensors are, the, the, one of the problems we have with this very large focal plane is we've got to read it out extremely quickly, okay? Because we don't want to spend a lot of time reading it out. Now it turns out there's a maximum rate you can read data out of the charge couple device without driving the noise way up. And so the only way to get around that is to highly parallelize the system. And so we have 16 readout ports for every 4K by 4K device, lots of electronics. Now with all those readout amplifiers, you've got to get the signals out into a cable. And there's various ways of doing that. One way of doing that is to have lots of little wires that come from the front of the detector to the backside where you can put them on traces and get them out through a cable. So a short answer is there's lots of tiny little delicate wires <laughs> on each of those sensors. It can't touch, and it takes very, very little to short out these devices. And once you short them out, they're gone. So we have to have incredible protection for electrostatic discharge in the laboratory when we're assembling them. That's basically the reason. Well, the, the 
Could lightning you... is a big issue, and we have a lot of lightning uh, protection in the dome, et cetera, but the camera's uh, electrically isolated to avoid that. It possibly, yeah. Um, it, the, your second question, will we make 3D? Yeah, for sure we're going to do that. We're going to be in every planetarium in the world, and we'll have all sorts of <laughs> fancy pictures to do this sort of stuff. <laughs> My name is Scott Matthews, and I'm a member. Um, uh, first, I want to know, are you hiring physicists and engineers that want to move to Chile? We, uh, we, um, are, we are. But sure. my real question is, um, but you were saying something about 250,000 transient events per night or, or some, some very large number of transient events per night. Is it even conceivable that you could correlate the transient data that you're getting with um, gamma ray telescopes and neutrino detectors and super cameo conde yeah. so that you could sift through all of these events and determine you know which ones really were significant transient events yeah so so it's a good question so first off just to get the numbers right so there's 10 million what we call time domain events per night that means 10 million times per night we'll say some object has changed in an image okay if you take out the obvious stuff we'll come down to about 100,000 or so. Now, the problem, of course, is that LST is a very, very big field of view. Our field of view is 40 times the size of the full moon. If you think about looking at the full moon in the sky and draw a circle 40 times bigger. But that's still a small fraction of the sky, which means at any given time, we're not looking at a lot of the sky. So a neutrino event is detected, or a gamma reverse detect is detected. The probability we happen to be looking at it during that particular few seconds when it went off is not that high still. It will happen, but it's not that high. The real issue is, you know, can we correlate all this stuff? And the answer is certainly yes. What's interesting about LSST is that this, the numbers are so large that we can pretty much guarantee that on any given night, there'll be a lot of examples of certain things that you're used to. So a lot of transient astronomy today is based on what are called target of opportunity observations. You know, something happens, somebody gets on a cell phone, calls somebody a telescope and say, quick, point the telescope over there, okay, because we want to get that. And there's a lot of worrying about being complete about that. With LSST, the numbers are so large, you can guarantee there will be events. So we can schedule the telescope time, we can arrange for the coordinated observations with other observatories and guarantee a sample. We won't get completeness, we won't, we won't cover all of our events that way, but we'll cover large numbers of them, which will be enough to do the science. What a wonderful talk. <laughs> I had this little um, vision, you get a galaxy, you get a galaxy. Um, <laughs> Uh, these are non-technical questions. My name is Chandler. I'm a friend of um, the PSW. <clears throat> Chile has had some huge earthquakes. Oh, yeah. So there has been some earthquake um, precautions right. taken in this. So how many billions did, I mean, because it looks like a bidet. I was just curious. <laughs> Doesn't, I don't know. It, it does. But so, so what, what kind of... Yeah, so let me talk a little bit about seismic stuff. So and, then, and then my other non-technical question is, when can we anticipate the citizen science? Stuff happening? Mm. There's some preparatory stuff happening in citizen science now, but things will really kick up in around 2019. 2019? Yeah. Okay. It's only three years. So let me, go, let me talk about seismic. So you're definitely right. There's lots of seismic activity in Chile. In fact, it's not an accident if you look at the best astronomical sites in the world. They're all seismically active because they're all high mountains. It all makes sense. Um, and obviously, we have to design the facility to survive. It turns out it's not a simple number. So you have different design criteria given the magnitude. So for example, there's a criterion for um, functional survivability. Okay, a magnitude earthquake at a certain level, you should not only survive it, but you should be able to continue operating with nothing different. And then there's, a, there's obviously a larger size event that you need, you, you need to ensure nothing falls, nobody gets hurt, but maybe it's not working an hour later. Okay, maybe it's going to take you a while to refurbish it. And then there's the level of the whole building comes down. And, that's it. and so you, you, the probabilities are governed to be, how, what's, the, what's the probability of that happening in so many years? So the basic survivability, does the whole thing fall apart? The spec is something like, Earthquakes that happen with a rate of about once every 300 years. 
and therefore the probability of it happening within 10 years we're operating is relatively small. The lesser things are more likely, but we're more solid against them, et cetera. Now, the interesting things is there are Chilean standards for these earthquakes, but we're also assembling that camera in California. <laughs> and that's also you know, right on the San Andreas Fault, actually. <laughs> so, that's, there's also, so it turns out the SLAC standards are tougher than the Chilean standards in terms of comparing all this. But all this has been checked and analyzed, and it's, it's a big factor. So that was all good. There, yeah, right. And there's well-defined art of how do you design mechanical systems for given seismic loads and track the accelerations, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, Carl Merrill, a member of the society. Um, what altitude is this being built at, and is that a problem? Yeah. And then the other question I have is just a general question about a previous survey on the great attractor and whether you have any comments on that and how this telescope will help us understand right. that. So in terms of altitude, actually, LSSC is not very high. It's only about 9,000 feet or so. Mauna Kea and Hawaii, which you know is a lot of telescopes, 14,000 feet. Now the difference, the, you want to be especially high if you're doing observations in the infrared because water vapor in the atmosphere absorbs infrared and the higher you get, obviously the less of that. We're, we don't go that far into the infrared. We go about one micron. And so that wasn't as strong a constraint on us. What is a constraint on us is cloud cover, seeing conditions, the atmospheric turbulence, and also the time distribution of cloud cover. There are a lot of sites which in the world which are good for most of the year and then for a couple of months of the year are terrible. And since we're trying to cover the whole sky and different objects come up at different times, we needed a site that wasn't subject to that. So those were turned out to be more important constraints than the actual altitude. This is a well-developed astronomical site. There are two other telescopes on it. So it's, it's perfectly fine, but it isn't anywhere near the highest in the world. In, in answer to your question about the greater tracker, yes, for sure. With such very, very large statistical surveys of large parts of the sky, we can do all those correlations that were used to find these very large structures. And that will be a very active area of research with, with LSST for sure. I'm Drew Griffin, and I'm a member. How far back to the Big Bang is your we the signal, the weakest signal that you can get? Yeah, so it depends on the type of galaxy, because we're looking at visible light. So we will see some objects out to redshift six or seven, um, whereas the microwave background is at redshift, uh, uh, what is it? 3,000, I think, something like that. So in terms of years, I think it's like 100,000 years. But, but yeah, I mean, so there's lots of interesting physics before galaxy formed. You know, there's lots of interesting physics in the first 10 to the minus 32 seconds. <laughs> so, so usually when people talk about the evolution of the universe, they talk about it in logarithmic scales, not absolute time, because lots of things are happening. But of course, we don't kick in until there's light to see which is when galaxies form, and, and we're very close to, and that's why we get 20% of all the galaxies. We're very close to the onset of the first galaxies in the universe, for at least some of them. But most, most of the galaxies we catalog will be more like redshift one, rather than six. Where are the other 80% of the gallery, gal uh, galaxies that you see? They're, they're either too faint, or they're in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mila Panashenko, I'm a visitor here. You mentioned early on that you needed, uh, in, in order to win um, the decadal survey, you were, you were at a very high technological readiness level. Can you give us a few examples of what got you there uh, ahead of time? Yeah, so it's kind of an interesting story with LSST. So the idea for it goes back to the mid-90s, mid to late 90s, but that was just an idea. Um, and it was sort of around the, uh, right around 2000 to 2003 that we started putting together a team to work on this. And the hard part with big projects is that there's this catch-22. They won't give you money until you've proven to them you can build a thing, and you can't prove to them you can build a thing with no money. So you get into this sort of thing where you're trying to convince people to work on it, you know, for free and in kind, and you do what you can with a very little bit of money, and there's always this er early period when we're doing this. Now, LSST is interesting because it's 
really for the first, not exactly the first time, but it's more than any other project has been this melding of the physics community and the astronomy community. Because the science is so diverse and the technical challenges are so high, we have people coming from particle physics backgrounds, from astronomical backgrounds working together, and we're really trying to capitalize on all that expertise. And it, and it was highly collaborative in that sense. We also did something sociologically unusual for a project like this. Rather than decide we're going to build it in one place and get everybody to work in that place, we decided we were going to find the best people in the U.S. who knew what they were doing and let them live wherever they lived. So we started the project with a very distributed team. And there's people working on LST all over the United States. And that's been a challenge. There are institutional fights that develop. There are individual fights. We rely on a lot of phone calls, a lot of air travel. But that was key to it. And that's part of the reason we made so much progress. We did a lot of advanced engineering, a lot of simulation work, a lot of prototyping. There's no way in hell we could have built this project if we hadn't done that, because there were all kinds of things we found that didn't work <laughs> the way that, way that we, we thought they would have worked before doing those investigations. So I don't have a simple answer to that, but we did more of it than, than many big projects have done before in trying to get to that level of readiness. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a member. Uh, what can be done in simultaneously looking at objects with your telescope and with other terrestrial telescopes or satellite telescopes? Yeah. That's a good question. So it's actually a big area of discussion right now. And we have workshops that are occurring on how do we optimize, now that this is going forward, we're building it, how do we optimize the science by doing coordinated things with other, other telescopes? One thing to realize that LSST is really built to be a dumb survey machine. It's not built to make the best measurements you can possibly make when you know where you're looking at. It's built to sort of survey as much of the sky as possible. It's kind of a finder scope, if you like. Find all the stuff. Once you know what you're looking at, you can look at it with other facilities, usually better. For example, we don't have a spectrometer. We just have multiple color bands. Once you know that that particular object's really interesting, you don't need a big field of view camera to look at it. You just look at that particular object with your spectroscope. So there's a lot of things like that, that it doesn't make sense for LSST to follow up. It does its own self-follow-up just because it does so many repeated exposures, but most of the follow-up is going to come from using other, other facilities. And th there is a challenge there in terms of getting that coordination and getting those other facilities to schedule the time, and that's what we're working on now. Now, when we were motivating this project with the government, you can't build a project that says, this will do great science if we get telescope time on this guy's facility and that guy's facility, et cetera. Because they say, if you need that to do the science, then cost it as part of your facility. <laughs> that would have been prohibitive. So there's a lot of science we define that can be done with the LSSD data alone with nothing else. And that alone is enough to justify spending the $650 million, et cetera. We believe that. But there's no question the science will be much better if a lot of other telescopes in the world are utilized with it. And the problem is the U.S. government doesn't own most of those other telescopes. They're either owned by foreign powers or they're owned by private consortia and things along those lines. So it's a bit of a political thing to negotiate that. But the science is really strong. It's very new. And I think most people in the community realize, you know, this is a great use of their facilities too, so we're forging those collaborations now. And the other interesting thing about LSST, more than has ever happened in astronomy before, this will, the science will involve large collaborations of people. In particle physics, they're used to this, not so much in astronomy. But this is clearly the way this is going to go. It's very large data, it's large complex analyses, it's going to take teams of even hundreds of people working together to get the full science out. And we're starting to see that sociology develop. And that will also bring in the other, the other telescope time. One last question, if we have one. Back there. Jim Hawk's not a member. I was wondering about Kuiper Belt objects. I haven't heard any mention of those. Yeah, we'll, those. yeah I didn't emphasize those as much. But we'll, we'll certainly get all the Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, we'll, they'll be detected in the difference imaging the same way. And they're easier in some sense, because they don't move as fast through the sky. The orbits are easier to, to determine. But yeah, that'll be a big part of the science. Yeah, for sure. So I'm going to take the last question and ask a sort of technical question. Sure. So uh, how does the LSST compare with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey camera, which at the time I thought was a pretty big detector, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, so I think the Sloan camera, first off, the Sloan camera was far fewer CCDs. 
I think it was about a half a degree, maybe, maybe 0.8 degrees in field, okay? By comparison, LSST is three and a half degrees, okay? So it's much, much larger part of the sky. It's also on a much bigger telescope. So we're getting much more light, which means the exposures are much shorter with LSST, and we can do many more of them in the same amount of time. Sloan surveyed about 5,000 square degrees of sky. LSST will survey about 20,000. And we'll do it with many more repeated exposures and to much fainter levels. So LSST will get down in the full 10 years to like 27th magnitude. Sloan got to about 20th. So seven magnitudes is about a factor oh, wow. of 100 to 1,000. Yeah. And the CCDs are photon counting CCDs? They're all photon counting CCDs. And they're, they're unusual. We had to develop totally new devices. There were no CCDs that existed that had all of our requirements. That cost a lot of money. We have two different vendors working on it. And so that's where we are now. That was a lot of the development. Well, thank you very much. Wonderful talk. Yeah. <laughs> Before you go. Uh -oh. Because he wants to take a picture. Oh, okay. So before you go, let me present you with a small token of appreciation, a framed copy of the announcement of your talk signed by the members of the General Committee on behalf of all the members of PSW and uh, all of those who came tonight to hear your lecture. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Larry. So before we go, there are a few things. Won't take long. But first, I have to do a little technical hookup here. Okay, so you know that's what we just heard. Before we adjourn to the social hour, just a few closing items. PSW depends on enthusiastic, active, and capable membership. Without these, no PSW, no free lectures. So please join if you're not a member. And if you are a member, please get involved in helping to carry out PSW activities. In particular, we're looking for members interested in helping us with writing, media, and web development, membership development, grant writing, and publicity. If you have skills in any of these areas and would like to explore volunteering to work with PSW, please see me after we adjourn. If you're not a member and you'd like to become a member, you can apply for membership on the PSW website. There's a button for membership. All you have to do is click it, fill out the form, and pay your dues. So it's easy. Please go to the website. How many of you are Meetup members? Don't be afraid, raise your hands, okay? Well, just so you know, we're really happy to have Meetup members, um, but being a member of Meetup is not the same as being a member of PSW, and we encourage you to join PSW. If you have any questions about membership, please see membership chair James Heelan or corresponding secretary Robin Taylor. And if you would like to give money, please see me. PSW is a nonprofit educational organization, tax exempt under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code, and contributions are tax deductible. Our next lecture will be the 2362nd lecture and the 85th Joseph Hemi Lecture. It will take place on 8, April 15th, 2016, just two weeks away here in the Powell Auditorium. The speaker will be Alan Stern, principal and scientist on New Horizons, which I'm sure you all know has visited Pluto and sent back spectacular results. He is the principal, in addition to being the principal scientist for New Horizons, he's the vice president for research at the Southwest Research Institute. He is the CEO of Uwingu and the CEO of the Golden Spike Company and CEO of a few other things that I didn't list here. He will be speaking about the exploration of Pluto Please check the PSW website for updates on the schedule. Finally, the social hour ends at 10.30, but the evening need not end then. 
After the social hour, PSW members and their guests will go across the street to the Fairfax Hotel Lounge to continue the discussion. If you're not familiar with the Fairfax Lounge, please, and you'd like to join us, please see me or Robin Taylor or James if he's still here. And with that, I will entertain a motion for adjournment of the 2,361st meeting of the Society to the Social Hour. And I will second. All in favor? All opposed? Meeting is adjourned to the Social Hour.